Managing your growth means focusing on several aspects. Taxes, for example. What changes in taxes when you become a BV? We will also discuss the possibilities of hiring staff. What type of employment suits your business best? And what will change? And we will take a look at financing. What types of financing are there in the Dutch financing landscape? We will discuss these topics with Johan Lafra of the Chamber of Commerce and our entrepreneurs, Jeta and Karim. Johan, with these different legal structures, there are different tax, uh, tax regulations. Yeah, uh, how does that work differently? Um, based on, I think for all legal entities, uh, the one that you all have to work with is the VAT in Dutch called the BTW, the, the, the value added tax. Um, that's something that works for every legal entity. The, the main difference is uh, when it comes to income tax uh, versus the uh, corporate tax. That's, uh, that's the biggest difference between uh, the personal entities and the legal structures. Does anything uh, changes in these taxes when you become a BV uh, compared to the other legal structures? Yeah, the one that isn't going to change is the VAT. That works the same for all of them. Um, uh, the biggest difference is that once you have a one-man business or a general partnership or the professional partnership, you pay income tax overall profit. And the difference with the legal entity, the BV, is that you'll be paying a salary uh, which should be um, what's, what's uh, normal in the market, but it needs to be at least 46,000 euros. That's uh, money that you'll pay your income tax over, but on top of that, um, if there's more profit, you'll start paying your corporate tax. And that's the biggest difference between the, uh, the personal entities and the legal structures. So does that mean that I would, if I would choose for BV, I would have to fill in two forms, both one for the income tax and one for the corporate tax? Yeah, it's tax? going to be in two different, uh, different tax systems. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's in addition to uh, just the income tax as a sole proprietor. Well, that's, that's good to know, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. And are there also tax reductions that entrepreneurs can use? Yeah, it's, uh, they, those go for the uh, one-man business and the partnerships. Uh, if you meet a certain criteria, you're entitled to all kinds of tax discounts. And uh, those discounts won't apply if you have a legal structure. And that's normally the reason why your profit needs to increase uh, on an annual basis before switching to a legal entity becomes interesting from a tax point of view. Okay, so you would say that in becoming a BV, uh, in a tax point of view, it would be a disadvantage, but especially if you're making more and more profit, uh, those will weigh up against yeah, each other. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Are there any other deductions maybe for the other legal structures apart from the BV uh, that these entrepreneurs could benefit from before? Um, yeah, based, I'd say that those are not um, part of the actual legal structure, but it depends on your activity. Once, uh, once you start doing something, there might be subsidies or research and development uh, things that you can use um, for your business. But those um, don't solemnly apply to just the legal form. It has to do what it is that you're doing. That sounds logical. Okay, that's good. Um, well, in that case, let's start talking about hiring staff. Uh, Jeta, do you currently uh, employ staff? Uh, yeah, we have a team of eight right now. Uh, well, that's the executives and the office team. Um, and everyone is working on, a, on their own terms um, because we're still fundraising uh, at this point. Um, we have people who we hired for zero hours and then they, are, they get paid per uh, jobs, they, well, number of hours they actually put in. Uh, but then there are people who are full time and they are very important to us for growth. And, yeah, and, th and then, yes, there are people who we deal with externally and just do contract basis. So you actually have quite a few different ways of employment. Yeah. Karim, do you, do you also have these different ways of employment? Uh, essentially, we work mainly with freelancers, so writers, editors, uh, marketeers, essentially, and no one is employed by us. We just have freelance contracts with them. 
I'm sure that has its advantages and, and different structures. Uh, so maybe Johan, uh, you could enlighten us in a theory. What kind of different types of employment are there in the Netherlands? There are so many ways <laughs> to, employ, to employ people. There's, there's a scenario for each and every one, but uh, I think that the biggest difference is you can hire someone uh, as an employee directly, so put them on your payroll and then mm -hmm. start working from there. I hear you saying something about zero-hour contracts, which is uh, fine too. You still be their employer, mm -hmm. but the amount yeah. of hours worked is uh, is yeah. variable. That's an option. You can hire people through temping agencies, through payrolling organizations, and you can even hire uh, independents like freelancers or ZZP people. Um, that's uh, that's all possible. So you'll be looking at whatever works for you, yeah. and there's probably an option for that. Of course, yes, that's what entrepreneurs should always keep in mind. What works best for me? Yeah. Um, and maybe that's a, a great intro for the next statement I have for entrepreneurs. And the statement is, it is better to have fixed term contracts than flexible ones. Um, and I feel you might both have a different answer to that. But Karim, let's start with you. Uh, I'm a big fan of flexibility. So, <laughs> you know my answer. <laughs> I figured that would be the case. Will that differ maybe when you become a BV uh, in the future? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we just need to see how the growth plan goes and what the resources and skills will need. It's all about what's available readily on the market. So I can imagine that we will uh, need that. Uh, based as the company grows, we will need new skill sets in the business. So. That sounds logical. Um, and Jeta, uh, I believe from your story, you, you had several types. Well, um, the, it really depends on uh, who we're talking with, with and uh, what exactly, what's the type of work that they are putting in. And uh, like, for example, when there are things related to intellectual property, because we have a lot of innovation to what we're doing. So there are probably rigid terms that we would impose. But on the other hand, having flexibility in our collaboration with anyone who we work with, is, uh, I think it's pretty important because you can't just be a woodpecker about this. <laughs> That's true. No, and especially when you're talking about IP, it's really important, of course. Yeah. So there's not one which you particularly would prefer? No, I, I mean, it's situational. You, you have to adapt to the situation, to the task at hand. To, so when you started Baby Moon in the beginning, uh, did you start with the flexible ones or the fixed term ones? Uh, well, when I started, I started with exploring where I landed, <laughs> let's put it this way, and it took a while. And at that stage, uh, there was a lot of um, research development done by me mostly. Uh, but then when I had to get people to do something for the company, then it would be a short-term, like, task-based agreement, and uh, it, was, it was limited. Uh, now, at the point when we have people on an ongoing basis being as part of the team and doing the Monday meetings and all of that with, with a stable team, it's a bit different. Um, but still, we, we keep the, the flexibility and we still have people from outside the company also providing input. So uh, it's a matter of, right now, it's a matter of like managing what's on the inside and then all those uh, satellite supporters that we have. So. It sounds like a colorful bunch together. Um, yeah. would you, uh, do you have any advice for the entrepreneurs at home, how they could choose what would be best suit their company? Um, well, I, I would think just to to know exactly the requirements they have for the people they hire and based on those requirements adapt the the way they hire them i think that's a good advice I, it's best to know <laughs> what you want in uh, up front so so then maybe a quick theoretical question for Johan again can a sole proprietor also hire staff yeah that's possible yes yeah that's possible is that possible in uh, any legal structure? Um... Yeah, the, the sole proprietor only says something about the, the number of owners of the actual business. So there's going to be one owner. As a partnership, you'll have multiple owners. As a legal entity, both can apply. But it only has to do with uh, ownership. And both can have uh, employees. And in all scenarios that we just mentioned. 
And I can imagine, of course, when you actually employ these people on fixed terms, these are probably having uh, financial consequences. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Once you hire someone, uh, then they become your employee. At that point, you need to set up uh, an, an administration. There's payroll taxes that need to be uh, that need to be done that need to be set in motion. Um, for some. It's fine to do yourself. Uh, I hear a lot of people saying that now I start working with personnel, the first thing I'm going to do is hire myself a bookkeeper or an accountant <laughs> to make sure that payroll taxes are taken care of the way it should be. But um, yeah, in the end, um, uh, you'll, you'll have to do with, um, uh, with employer stuff. And um, yeah. Yeah, you, you touch upon a really important point there because, of course, there are many regulations and rules around that. So, yeah. uh, what would you say are the most important uh, employment contract terms and condition in the Netherlands here that you yeah. should be aware of? Well, it, it, first off, it depends on the uh, contract that you're going to set up. Will you be setting up someone for, let's say, 40 hours a week for the rest of their life? That, that's a different scenario than when you start working with people on a zero-hour contract. So that's the first thing that you need to look at. Uh, what kind of agreement am I going to set up? And once you do, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. You'll be paying your uh, employer wages for your personnel, the salary that's, that's uh, required. Most of the time, people actually want to earn some money. Um, <laughs> and you'll be paying some, some benefits on, uh, on top of that as an employer. So that's, uh, that's important. But there's um, uh, all kinds of, uh, um, well, as I just said, there's the minimum wage that you need to take care of. Uh, uh, you need to set something in place for, uh, for holidays and, and stuff like that. There's pension, there's uh, insurances that need to be covered. All those elements combined um, make uh, the official contract. That's quite a bunch of rules and regulations there to is. be aware yeah, of. There is. Um, yeah. So, Kariba and Jeta, are any of these Dutch rules that we have here, did they come as a surprise? Were they different uh, to what you were used to? No. I worked here already for quite a few years, so there was a lot of stuff that I knew about the system. So, it was a little bit easier for me, um, yeah, in that sense. And for you, Jen? No, I, 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 well, I think these are all points that are valid and relevant wherever you do business, so you have to keep all of that in mind. Um, on the other hand, if I compare just the paperwork uh, processes here, it, it is much less complicated than in Eastern Europe where I come from. Um, but then the fact that it's uh, simplified has to make you a bit more aware of what you're putting into that contract. Because when you're just winging it, <laughs> <laughs> that's not a good idea ever. So uh, at times, it's, it's actually good to have a uh, possibility to have an advisor, to ask someone uh, for their professional input. Um, if you feel that you're not qualified well enough to build the contract yourself. True. Because sometimes you can just uh, not be aware of some aspects and then that can bite you Very later on. Yes, that's good. it's good that you mention it uh, because just to sort of close this off, are there any other more as aspects that our entrepreneurs should know when working with staff? Yeah. I'd say that always start at the beginning, as already mentioned by uh, our two guests uh, today, um, is that, that uh, what it is that you're looking for. And um, if you have a very clear picture of what the future is going to look like, it's going to be much easier to hire someone directly uh, for a longer period. So uh, look at um, the, the coming months, maybe the first one, two years. See where you're planning on going. And based on that, you can make the right choice regarding your, your stuff. So have a clear picture. It, it applies to every segment today. Yes. <laughs> um, have <laughs> a clear picture of where you want to go. Think about it and have a clear picture. That's true. And then you can start with your staff. That's um, true. And, I, and I can imagine you have staff and your employees, uh, they have to work somewhere. Do you have an office space at the moment, Jeta? Yeah, 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 we do have an office <laughs> space. I'm very excited about that because we moved to the office just a few months back. So it's really exciting that uh, the people can <laughs> come. We like, no, well, there is this point that uh, a big part of our team works remotely because they're not located in the Netherlands. We have people in Switzerland, we have people in Tanzania, we have people in Moldova, so it's pretty interesting. And how did you find them, actually, if they're from all over the it world? It took a while. <laughs> do you use LinkedIn, or how do you um, find them? Well, uh, it's... Um, 
some people, yes, um, someone actually I found on LinkedIn, uh, others, it, it was just a matter of engaging the networks that, that I, I have, so, well, me and then the other people involved. Um, and it doesn't have to be LinkedIn necessarily. It's just a network is a network. It's just yeah, human so connection. Yeah, so that's the biggest part, probably. You good network and yeah. through that, find the right employees. Yeah. Is that the same way you do it, Karim, with your freelancers? Uh, actually, it's a little bit, yes. In some way, yes. The thing is, we already have a huge following. I mean, we have close to 110, 115,000 followers as expats living and working in the Netherlands. So for us to recruit talent is, we just use our own network. Um, already people come to us and solicit us, hey, can I write for you? Can I work with you? So, oh, wow. I've had that luxury, actually, so that's great. And I have some incredible people on my team that I'm really proud of, and it's, it's been really a nice journey. So. so actually, it once again then comes down to network, but in that, this case, the fact that everyone knows you instead yeah. of you know everyone. Looks <laughs> a <laughs> problem, as they say in Dutch. <laughs> because uh, for Jada, for you again then with hiring staff, uh, yeah. what are actually the most important aspects you look at when hiring a new person? Uh, well, at this point of the development of the company, we're definitely looking at people who can deal with uh, uncertainty. <laughs> and, well, uh, uncertainty is not necessarily a 2020 thing, <laughs> especially when you're dealing with startups and innovation. Um, and uh, we're looking at people who can self-organize and uh, can be goal-driven and um, that's probably a common denominator that we're looking at but then also having good background in the specific work that they are doing that's that's important no that's really important look what they've done yeah. and see if they can yeah. build on from there in your company yeah I believe we've got quite a lot of tips for entrepreneurs regarding hiring um, so let's go to financing uh, Johan could yeah. you elaborate a bit more on the types of financing there are in the Netherlands um, you can uh, ask friends and family. You, yeah, that's, I think that's the easiest one. Uh, uh, there's uh, uh, microcredits that you can apply for. There's uh, bank loans. There's investors that you can uh, that you can get into your your business. Um, I'd say that for every scenario, there's an, uh, a possibility to uh, to gain money somewhere quite a few number of ways to get to financing. Uh, maybe it's interesting in that case to have a statement for entrepreneurs again. And the statement this time is, I recommend uh, looking for funding. It depends. <laughs> of course, it depends. <laughs> it depends, because once you take in financing from somewhere else, there are restrictions and uh, terms to that financing it, to, to that fin financing. Do you actually need the funds? Because raising money for the sake of raising money without a purpose and you see a lot of entrepreneurs they get their pitch deck really good to oh i raised so much but in reality in my view the best investor is a paying customer that's true that's very that's true. true that's very yeah. true Geta, how do you look at this well i agree with karim completely so there are like most of the times it's best to have the paying the paying customer but then on the other hand um like when you have to deal with like in my case uh because we have all the research and development because we're dealing with electronic textile and things that are like a uh, physical product well aside from being a physical product it's also innovation and it's not something that's uh, mm -hmm. common and widespread uh, you have to fund uh, the innovation in way, in various ways. You have to figure it out how to build it because it's a long process because you have to build it, you have to certify it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the good opportunity uh, here uh, is actually the possibility to fund R&D um, because there are a bunch of subsidies for that. There are a bunch of uh, grant opportunities. There are even... Um, uh, uh, loans that uh, are non-dilutive so then you can still keep the ownership of your company but then again you can also have access to venture capital which is uh, still, a useful tool yeah. uh, but again it depends very much on what you're doing because uh, if I remember correctly you are currently in the process of uh, funding right yes yeah how did you get to the choice of which funding you were going for uh, well um, 
in my case, uh, aside from the fact that we have a lot of R&D in our company, I still have uh, a physical product that is already there and ready for market release because the the innovative version, well, they are all innovative, but the <laughs> the electronic connected versions, they still have to go through like a, a lot of work. Uh, but we have a product ready for release to market, which means that uh, I can have my company income and I can have paying clients uh, on top of the R&D part. So that's a specific of my company because I have colleagues in mm -hmm. the startup world who only have the R&D for the first three years and they can't generate uh, income. So you really looked for R&D funding in the beginning? Um, we are looking for R&D funding uh, at this point as well. But so, yeah. And how did you know how to find this R&D funding? Did you have a network again? Oh, of that, 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 yes. <laughs> that, that was a process. That was a challenge. Uh, like, to be honest, I had uh, three years that were really, really financially, like we had to go through a very tight belt, let's put it this way, uh, period. Um, ah, the bootstrapping phase. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then again, it, it wasn't easy. But on the other hand, I think it's important not to take in funding before you know where you're going, before you can handle it as a company. So, yeah, we had to explore, so we we took our moment <laughs> there. Well, that's really good advice. But then, to know but then again, to go, yes. uh, we also uh, took that time period to explore the possibilities for funding, because here the Netherlands does give you a lot of opportunities that are on a spectrum. Like you can literally go from subsidies, from grants and loans, and da da da. da. So. Aside from just the money coming in, you have to also take into account, like, do you want to keep shares in your company? Do you want to deal with other people telling you how to run your business? Do you want to, uh, like, put an effort and pay out loans? So of course, yes. you have to have a funding strategy. Yes. Not just like, oh, there's cash, let's, get, <laughs> let's go for it. <laughs> so I can imagine that this strategy, of course, had to be written up uh, in a written plan for when you were looking for this funding? Yeah, well, uh, you have to put things on paper because you, when you go to any funding organization, <laughs> they will not uh, give you the money just for the pretty eyes. <laughs> so, that's, so, no, that's true, that's very yeah, true. Yeah, you have to turn it into a document. And, uh, but before you put it on paper, you have to know what you're putting on paper. <laughs> and then you have to do the research before that. So it's a backtracking thing. Karim, do you recognize this situation? I mean, do you have uh, entrepreneurs in your network that are looking for funding like uh, that? Yeah, sure, we see it all the time. Uh, and what's actually interesting in the Netherlands is there's actually like advisors that can actually go and help you raise money. Yeah. Of course, they take for, a fee yeah. for a price, of course. <laughs> but that's a profession that's readily available to, to help uh, people raise money. So we're quite lucky setting up businesses in the Netherlands, actually. Would you advise uh, entrepreneurs looking right now to also look at one of these coaches? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. 100%. Johan, can you also relate to the answers uh, Geta and uh, Karim just gave? I was wondering, uh, did, did any uh, of you uh, uh, contact me in the... In the, the, the because we, <laughs> as an organization as well, can help uh, in the, in the uh, early process of uh, getting uh, possibilities out and maybe even uh, refer you in a certain a certain direction. But yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, what, what was just told. And, uh, and again, keep an eye out for what it is that you need. I think that's a very valuable point. It's not just about raising as much capital uh, as, you, as you want and can, but it, there's a need and it, it, that needs to be clear. And once you know that, you can decide which way you're going to go. And that makes it a lot easier to write, yeah. uh, write down all the, the necessary paperwork. Mm. So I totally agree. Yeah. That's good to hear. Then the advice can be followed. We have been looking at taxes for entrepreneurs and what changes when you become a BV. And we looked at the forms of employment in the Netherlands and the things that you should take into account when you start hiring staff. If you want to know more about financing your business, we recommend you watch our webinar on this specific topic. There, you learn all about the Dutch financial climate and preparing to apply for Dutch funding. And more about the financing options in the Netherlands we discussed briefly today. You find this at our website, business.gov.nl.